Thank you very much. And thank you very much for inviting me. It's nice to see everybody. I notice most people in the audience are female, going along with all the statistics. And um, I'd like to also thank Maria Hickey for inviting me again to talk. So a lot of you who've been here before will have heard me speak before, and it's pretty similar to what I said the last time. I'm going to talk as an ophthalmologist or an eye doctor about blepharospasm, which is a focal dy dystonia which affects the eye. There are lots of big long words. It's a focal dystonia. In other words, it just affects the circular muscle that goes around the eye. And that circular muscle closes the upper eyelid and the lower eyelid. Um, it's also known as a primary idiopathic um, dystonia. And it can be, as you've heard already, it can be hereditary. You may have other family members with the same problem. Or you, it may be sporadic. You may be the first person to experience this problem. Um, if you take one million people in the population, it's been shown that about 300 of those people will have blepharospasm. Um, and it's usually, again, very similar to the cervical dystonia. It can affect people in their 40s up to people in their 70s. It can start off as a new problem in a 70-year-old person. And again, it's more common in females um, than in men. I refer to it as a primary essential blepharospasm. That's what most people will, complain, will have. But we do see it in patients with other diseases or disorders. I see a lot of patients um, who have Parkinson's disease and in a very unusual type of Parkinson's disease called PSP, um, where you start off with maybe visual hallucinations or early falls, but you look like you have Parkinson's disease. And these patients get a very severe type of, um, of blepharospasm. It doesn't look like blepharospasm. Their eyelids just simply don't open. So they've been rendered physically blind. And um, a lot of those patients um, will come to the eye doctor with very vague complaints. And you have to ha be very highly alert to the fact that they might have this problem. I also see patients who've been on psychotropic drugs. Psychotropic drugs are drugs that affect your mood. So drugs for depression, drugs for anxiety, drugs for people who've had a psychosis. Um, these drugs can cause blepharospasm. So you have to be very careful to find out what drugs pa patients are taking. People always wonder when I ask them about what medications they're on because they say, oh, that's nothing to do with my eye doctor. But it may very well have something to do with your eye. And to decide whether someone has benign essential blepharospasm or blepharospasm because of a drug, you have to have discontinued the drug if it's safe to do so for two months to see if that's what's causing the problem. So what exactly is benign essential blepharospasm? Well, it's, it's a progressive disorder that really slowly creeps up on you. And as a lot of you will know who have blepharospasm, it's very difficult to get a diagnosis because it starts off with vague symptoms like your eyes just don't feel right. They feel uncomfortable. You can't really put it into words. Um, they might feel gritty. Um, they might feel very sensitive to light or to dust or to fluorescent lights. You mightn't like going into certain situations like a big supermarket where they've got fluorescent lights. And it progresses and becomes steadily worse over about one to two years. And you've gone to loads of different eye doctors and they've given you all these artificial tears and maybe some steroid drops which have their dangers and no one's really made a diagnosis and then the doctor starts getting annoyed with you because they don't know what's wrong with you and they want to get rid of you out of their surgery because they don't know what's wrong they can't find anything wrong and they haven't thought well maybe this person has blepharospasm and they haven't really seen it yet and eventually it gets so bad that your eyes are forcibly being forcibly um, contracting the orbicularis, it's a circular muscle, as I said already, that goes around the eye and it goes into a, it's like a concertina, it goes into a contraction and it, it can be so forceful that your eyelids can turn in and scratch the cornea. And the cornea is a little window of the eye which is extremely highly uh, packed with nerves and if that gets scratched, it's extremely painful and very frightening. Both eyes are usually affected, but it can start off with just one eye being affected. And that can be quite embarrassing. I had one lady who came to me, and she thought her boss, was wink her boss thought that she was winking at him because she had one eye that kept closing. 
and uh, <laughs> she found this very disconcerting. Um, it can um, be exacerbated by certain conditions, as I said, going into fluorescent lights, ha traveling in a, in a car or in a train or in a bus uh, can set it off. Some people find that if they drive, it goes away, but most people find that they can't drive because of it. Um, dust, smoke, um, and then some people, one lady, she can read, and all she can do is read or she can watch TV, but if she tries to have a conversation with somebody or to walk, it comes on, and she's unable to walk. So just this is a patient who doesn't mind. He gave us this photograph. This was taken when I worked in Queen Square in London, um, and he's got very forcible eyelid closure. And this is the one that's very difficult. This is called apraxia of eyelid opening. And this is where you don't have the spastic closure of, of the eyelids, but the eyes just close gently down as if you're sleeping and you cannot open them. You're, no matter what you, your brain tries to tell your eyelids to do, you cannot open them. And this is called apraxia of eyelid opening. And this is a very difficult type of blepharospasm to diagnose. Is the patient doesn't always have it when they come into the doctor because often when you're having a conversation with somebody in a quiet room that's a bit dark because us eye doctors like to work in a dark room um, your eyes open and it looks as if there's nothing wrong with you we use a to what's called a ptosis crutch ptosis means droopy lid and you can see a pair of glasses here with two little arms on the back and you can use those glasses to open up the eyelids. Now, again, sometimes the spasm is so strong that you cannot use the ptosis crutch to open your eyelids. And the, the ptosis crutch will allow you to blink a certain amount as well. But sometimes together with Botox and maybe a tablet, the ptosis crutch can be very helpful, particularly if you're trying to drive somewhere. You can use it temporarily. This is a, 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 more, a less strong form of ptosis crutch. And um, there's an optician called Donal O'Malley, lovely man who works down in Dixon Hempen's stalls in Suffolk Street. And he takes the measurement and orders the ptosis crutches. They're made in England. And you can function very well. And he also makes these ones on site with the sunglasses. And they're very light. And if you're not spasming too badly, you can use those. And they also help with the photosensitivity that you get with blepharospasm.